Hi, thank you very much for tuning into this Bible study. Today, we are going through Romans chapter four. We are gonna be looking at one subject today, and we're using Romans four to kind of be the um, caveat for that, and that is this question of do we get our salvation through our faith in Christ or through the things that we do works? Salvation by grace through Jesus Christ our Lord, or salvation through works. And this is a debate. This really is a debate. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, has actually been talking about this quite a bit in the past few chapters. And today he is going to use Abraham as an example of the argument for salvation by grace. And he's specifically going to talk about righteousness, the righteousness of Abraham. So I want to define uh, a few terms before we dig into it. Specifically, what I want to define is salvation, righteousness, works, grace, and faith. Because all those things are in this question. Is it salvation by works or salvation by grace through faith? So what do I mean by these? What do these terms mean? Well, first of all, salvation. That's one that, that gets tossed around a lot, and, and the definition should be pretty simple and easy to know. Salvation is being saved. What does it mean to be saved? In the Old Testament, it has slightly different connotation than the New Testament. I mean, if you look at Exodus, God saved his people, the Jews, from the oppression of, of Pharaoh in Egypt through the Exodus. That was God's salvation. Uh, in the New Testament, we see salvation um, specifically manifest in Jesus Christ. And the definition that we have, um, Jesus, the Savior, or deliverer from sin and its consequences, as well as from Satan and his power. That is the definition given uh, in the uh, Bible dictionary that I have. Acts 4.12 defines salvation is found in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation is to be saved, to no longer be uh, bound by sin and to be saved in the sense of going to eternal life, no longer being bound by death, salvation. Okay, now righteousness. We had a whole talk on that two weeks ago, I think, in which I went deep into what righteousness is. Um, but simply put, it's being right with God uh, as defined by the law. It is doing right. It is, uh, the opposite of it is wickedness. Righteousness is good, wickedness is bad, but it's defined by the law. Uh, what is right? I like to think about it as far as being right with God, but it is doing right. It is doing the right thing, whatever that might be. Uh, Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 defines it as this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupt by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So righteousness... Is, is perfection. It is being right. It is doing right. And as we've discussed before, I'm not going to go into this, the only way we are able to achieve righteousness is through God's grace by putting on Christ. And that's specifically what Ephesians 4.20 talks about is, is that as a Christian, you now uh, you die to the old self and you are born anew to the new self. And through Christ, we are able to put on his righteousness. So we are right with God because of his grace. Now, uh, let's define works. We're going to find grace in a second, but works in this, in this question, we need to define what works are. It's simply, I mean, works is self, uh, self, uh, explanatory. It is literally works. It's what we do in our modern day, Western term work is exactly that you do X in your job. You get paid Y. There is an expectation. You do this, you will see this. Uh, it's a person's actions or deeds. What we do, work is that which we perform for reward. 
your job, work, you do X, you get paid Y. In the context of salvation, works refer refers to good deeds we do, especially religious or charitable acts or the observance of the Old Testament law. As a Christian or as a Jew, uh, works are those things that we do because we're called to do or because they are good deeds to be done. That definition that I just read was from uh, gotquestions.org. So that's works. What is grace? Grace is unearned unmerited favor from God. It's like the idea of a gift. God gives you this gift of grace. What did you do to earn it? Nothing. What did you do to deserve it? Nothing. And once it's been given, can it be taken back? No. It is a everlasting gift that has been given to everyone, uh, and that is God's grace. Uh, unearned, unmerited favor from God, we did nothing to deserve it, to earn it. It is a gift. Once given, requires nothing from the recipient. Once given, it cannot be rescinded. Paul, who's the author of the letter to the Romans, 100 of the 155 times that the Greek word charis, which means grace, occurs in the New Testament, 100 of the 155 times it occurs in the New Testament, it's in a Pauline letter. It's a letter that Paul writes. So 100 of the 155 times it's used, it's used by Paul. Paul, as we've discussed, knows God's grace and his mercy so much. Why? And we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go down this tangent too far. But Paul was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He sought out, persecuted, and killed Christians in the early church. He was uh, an evil dude that was doing evil uh, and going around and persecuting Christians. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and specifically asks him straight up, Paul, why do you persecute me? And it's through his grace, unearned, undeserved favor from God, that Paul is saved and becomes the amazing man of God. So Paul knows very, very well what grace is, and he's going to talk about that even more as we continue on in Romans. Final definition that I want to give in this question of faith, uh, uh, grace through faith in Christ or works salvation is what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 defines it. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is that which assures us that our hope is reality even though we cannot yet see it. If we have faith, we are convinced that what we believe is real, true, and reliable. Faith is reliance on God. So I know that's relatively elementary in going back and defining each of these things, but for those people who are new believers that are, that are listening to this, those are a lot of Christianese words. In me, in me asking this question, is it salvation by works or is it salvation by grace through faith? I just wanted to define what those things are before we got going. So now as we open up uh, Romans 4, why don't you bow your heads and uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time. I pray, Lord, that you will open up the ears and the hearts and the minds of those people that are listening and that you will help us understand this, this question of works. What are we called to do? What are we supposed to do? And receiving your grace your forgiveness through faith in you. Help us to understand, Lord, because it's a complicated subject. I pray, Lord, that you will speak through me, that these are your words, not mine, and that the Holy Spirit will use me right now to convey your message and your word to your people. I love you, Lord. Be here now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know that intro was a little tedious, uh, but I hope it was helpful in defining those, those terms. Okay. So what I'm going to do, that's Matthew. Uh, why is my mark here in Matthew? We'll, we'll hit Matthew in a second. We are going to jump around a lot in the Bible today. Uh, but we are in Romans chapter 4. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read all of chapter 4. And the reason being is it's, it's all one subject. So what I invite you to do is just sit back and listen and just absorb uh, if you want to follow along, follow along. But uh, I always like uh, when listening to studies to just to sit back and just take it in and just try to digest God's word. So picking up on verse 1 of Romans 4. What then shall we say? 
that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David said the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing. And the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb also was dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and so gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. McKinsey. So that is Romans chapter 4. Now let's talk about this. I, I want to, we're going to do two sections here uh, for the remainder of this talk. We're going to first look at Abraham as the, this example of righteousness by faith. Uh, and then we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about this larger argument of um, salvation by works or salvation through grace in faith, uh, uh, through faith. Of Jesus Christ. So first, let's dig into Abraham. Paul uh, jumps all over the place. Uh, he's quoting from Genesis 12, uh, 15, and 17 as he goes through and he talks about Abraham. So let's, uh, 
Let's talk about Abraham. Who was Abraham and why is this so significant? And what is Paul talking about when he talks about circumcision and the fact that was, was Abraham considered righteous before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? And why is that significant? Why is Paul bringing that up? We're going to talk about all of this. So leave your marker here and let's flip all the way to... Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at Abraham. Father Abraham. So 12.1, Genesis 12.1. Now, Abram is Abraham, and we're actually going to see God change his name. Uh, and his wife, Sarai, her name is going to be changed to Sarah. And this is very similar uh, to Simon Peter that... Christ, in the New Testament, the disciple, Simon, is going to have his name changed to Peter by God. Same thing with uh, Abram. So when you see in verse uh, uh, 1 of chapter 12 here in Genesis, Abram, it's the same dude, same guy. Uh, so verse 1 of chapter 12, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So at this time, Abraham is living in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, which is modern day Tal al Mukara, which is in Iraq. It's northwest of Basra, and he is called by God at 75 years old. God calls him and says, I am going to make you into a mighty nation, and I want you to travel. I want you to leave your hometown, and I want you to travel uh, to a land that I have promised to you. And he's going to travel up the th th uh, Fertile Crescent. In fact, I'm going to uh, uh, put this map up that I have in my Bible, and you'll see um, from Ur, uh, which also does actually give us the modern day town in Iraq that that is. And he travels up the Fertile Crescent all the way around to Canaan. And then he's going to continue on down to Damascus. This is a huge ask that God has called him to do. And this promise is a big one saying that you are going to be a mighty nation and that I am going to bless you. And those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. And that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That is God's promise. And as we uh, flip over and continue, so um, Abraham does this and he continues on this journey. He, he travels all around um, uh, to Egypt even. But when he's in Canaan, uh, let's go to verse 13, uh, or excuse me, chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted with him, look around from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and the west. All the land that, you, land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. This is continuation of the Abrahamic covenant. This is the promised land that God is promising to Abraham then continuing on, um, go to ver uh, chapter 15, and this is where we actually see, um, by this point, it's been a couple of years since that original promise when Abraham is uh, 75, he's traveled, he's in Canaan, um, and now he starts to question God just a little bit. So in chapter 15, verse 2, but Abraham said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no ch children, so ser a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the, the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars. Indeed, if indeed you can count them, then he said, So shall your offspring be. And verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So this is getting back to what Paul said. The covenant of circumcision has not yet been given to Abraham. 
and to Israel. I mean, the Jews don't even exist at this point. Israel, as a nation, doesn't exist yet. But yet, at this point, Abraham believed God and had faith. He has no children. He's old. Sarah is old. She's 10 years younger than him, but still way past child-rearing ages. And yet, he has faith that God's going to do what God said that he was going to do. So now let's continue on. Um, now, going on to uh, ver uh, chapter 17. Now, one of the things that I struggled with in reading this, uh, leave your finger here. I'm jumping around, I know. Uh, but I hope it's beneficial. I know it will be, actually. So, in Romans, we see... Paul say that Abraham didn't question God, that he was unwavering, right? Um, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. That's in Romans 4, 20. And he repeats it again um, later on that, that he didn't waver. And that, to me, if you know the story of Abraham, it's like, wait a second. What about, this, what about Hagar and Ishmael? For those of you who don't know the story, this is uh, in Genesis 16, right? So God promises to Abraham that he's going to be this mighty nation. And if you can count the dust, you can count your descendants. And if you can count the stars, you can count your descendants. And if you can count the sands uh, of the desert, you can count your descendants. And he's childless. So Sarah realizing how old she is and knowing that she hasn't been able to, f to provide Abraham with an heir, she has this idea uh, and she presents it to Abraham and says, hey, you know, I, I can't, I have been unable to provide you with children. My handmaiden, Hagar, uh, who we picked up in Egypt, why don't you marry her uh, as another wife and sleep with her, and then you will be able to receive God's promise through her. Abraham loved the idea and said, okay, uh, <laughs> and went ahead. And they, uh, Hagar got pregnant, and that's where Ishmael comes in. And we'll come back to Ishmael and the Ishmaelites and what they can, who they are now today. But isn't that an example of Abraham not trusting God? That's one of those things that for me, when I read through Romans, I was like, wait, wait, hold on. Wait a tick. Doesn't he do this? But Paul says that he didn't waver in his faith that the Lord would provide. So I don't know. I mean, uh, Romans is the inspired word of God. These words that Paul gives us are the words of God. They were meant to be there. So we know through looking at Romans that Abraham's faith was solid, but he was looking for his own way to fulfill that promise. And we do that so much today. I know I do that. God says, I'm going to do this. And I immediately start thinking of all of these ways in which God can provide that. One of my favorite verses, Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait on him, to the soul who seeks him. That's why I have that tattooed, Lamentations 3.25, because I want so much to do of my own works, fulfill the promises that God gives me. And I think that's what happens here with Abraham. He is confident that God will do what God said he would do, but he's impatient. And so Sarah gives him this offer to take on another wife. Now, we today in our monogamous society, um, at this time, it was not uncommon for men to have multiple wives. Um, it's not that crazy of a concept. Uh, and so it's not at that outlandish as we hear it today. Uh, if my wife, Celicia, were to say the same thing, it would be like, what? That's insane. So it's not, in the historical cultural context, it's not that crazy. But still, that to me gave me pause, and I wanted to explain that little tangent. So uh, chapter 17 when Abram was 99 years old, uh, I'm in Genesis 17, 
uh, verse 1. When he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. I love that. Does he say anything? Nope. He falls flat on his face. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll be the father of many nations. No longer you will be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make, your nation, make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So then we, uh, flipping on to 17, 17. He's 100 years old now at this point. God's still, 99, excuse me. God's still making these promises and Abraham still has faith. But he's still, he, he is solid as Paul tells us in Romans that he always believes God and trusts in him. But like us today, your faith can be super strong and then it can waver a little bit. You still believe God, but you question God. Are we not supposed to question God? Does Abraham not question God? Uh, verse 17 of Genesis 17, Abraham, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to me, a man of a hundred years old? Will Sarah be a child, uh, bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. So Abraham is questioning God and simply says, Lord, I, I, I have faith that you are going to do what you said, but I'm a hundred. Sarah's 90. I do have a son through Hagar, Ishmael. Why not fulfill your blessing that you have promised to make me a great nation through Ishmael? And God does respond and say, I will, I've heard your blessing and I will bless Ishmael and his descendants. But no, Sarah is going to have a child. Uh, chapter 18 of Genesis, we actually see a Christophany. A Christophany is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Before he is born to Mary in the flesh, we see God come down in the flesh and he sits down and has a conversation with Abraham. There's three of them, two angels and Jesus. And one of them says this, uh, chapter 18, verse 10. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. This continuation of this promise that we keep hearing over and over and over again, Sarah hears this and she laughs. She literally laughs out loud and the, the angel, or Jesus, I don't know which it is at this point, uh, says, why did Sarah laugh? Uh, did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? That's verse 13 of 18. Uh, then continuing on, uh, where is it? The birth of Isaac in chapter 21. Um, we see um, Sarah become pregnant and she names the child Isaac. And Isaac means laughter. And uh, Sarah, I, I, I didn't uh, underline it, but uh, uh, Sarah specifically says, because in my old age, uh, I've been able to bear a child, people will laugh with me at my joy. So uh, Isaac is named laughter. And from Isaac, you get Jacob, and then Jacob then becomes Israel and has the 12 tribes uh, of Israel, and the nation of Israel is born. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and after that, you have Exodus, them going into Egypt, and the creation of Israel as a nation. All comes back to Abraham. So in looking at Romans and Paul, the righteousness that is credited to Abraham, the argument that Paul is making in Romans chapter 4 is that that righteousness we see in chapter 15 it's before the covenant of circumcision is given, which is in chapter 17. 
And it's before Isaac is born in chapter 21. The point that Paul is making in Romans chapter 4 is that the righteousness that is credited to Abraham is before he did anything. All he did was simply believe. So the point that Paul's getting back to is that it is not by works. Because as you recall, we've been going through Romans, and in Romans, he's talking to the Jews as well as to the, the Gentiles that are believers, and there's this tension that exists where the Jews, the, the, the Christ-believing Jews, Messianic Jews, are questioning what works they should do. And Paul is saying to them that it's not through the works that you do in trying to follow the law that you receive salvation. And it's not through simply being a Jew and through being the chosen people of God as the Jews are that you receive salvation. But it is through faith that you receive salvation. I hope that is helpful. And going back and looking at who Abraham is and who that story is, uh, I also do have to say it's interesting uh, modern times. The Bible is real. And there's two things that I want to point out about this that I love about Scripture. The first one, the, the mighty men that we have that are our church fathers that we can look to and say Abraham and David are two examples that we've hit on in the past few weeks. The Bible doesn't pull any punches in showing that they are human and that they make mistakes. Should Abraham have taken Hagar as his wife and had Ishmael, he was trying to fulfill God's promise of his own accord, as opposed to waiting on the Lord. David and Bathsheba was an example that we gave a few weeks ago. David is this amazing man after God's own heart. And yet he's screwed up. He sees this beautiful woman bathing, lusts after her, sleeps with her, and kills the husband to hide his sin. These amazing men of God, they are fallible just like we are fallible. But the other thing that I want to point out, what came from Ishmael and Isaac, Abraham's two sons? God says to Abraham that I've heard your plea and I will bless Ishmael and he will become a mighty nation. Well, what happened with that? The Ishmaelites. What happened with that? Did God not fulfill that promise? No, he did. Who are the mighty descendants of Ishmael? The Arabs. The Arab-Israeli conflict is a family food that go, feud that goes all the way back to Abraham. Not only the Jews and the Christians, but the Muslims also look back to Abraham as their father. And the Arab-Israeli conflict that exists to this day is that tension that existed at the day when Abraham between Ishmael and Isaac and between Sarah and Hagar. Sarah, after she had Abraham, excuse me, Sarah, after she had Isaac, couldn't stand to see Hagar and Ishmael and they had to get kicked out of the camp and there was that division. And God still blessed them, but it's just interesting. It comes all the way back to today and the, the Arab-Israeli conflict that still exists right now. Huge tension right now between Iran and Israel. It's not a new conflict by any means. Okay, so now, uh, oh, that was a long tangent. I wasn't expecting to talk about that, but... Um, it's good stuff. I love that stuff. So what does the rest of the Bible say? And do we have a contradiction in the Bible? I'm going to rattle through a ton of verses in looking at salvation by works or salvation by grace through faith. So first of all, let's look at works. Let's look at works. Romans 2, 5 through 7 Romans 2, 5 through 7, we just read this uh, two weeks ago, not last week, but uh, the week before that. God will repay each person according to what they have done. That's works. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immor immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who, who are self-seeking and 
uh, and who reject the truth and follow evil, there'll be wrath and anger. Paul in Romans 2, 5, 7 clearly is saying there's works and you're going to be judged based on your works. Revelation 22, 12, this is Christ. And he says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. These are the words of Jesus at the very end of the Bible. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. That clearly, Jesus is saying, I'm going to reward you based on your works. Let's actually open up for this one. Matthew 25. Again, the words of Jesus. And this is why I have my marker on Matthew. Matthew 25. I'll give you a second to get there. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. This is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you in invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick and in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So this is Jesus talking. And he's talking about the fact that at the end of days, there will be a judgment. And that the righteous will be rewarded based on the righteous things that they've done. And the wicked will be punished for the wicked things that they've done. That's clearly, that's clearly works that that's establishing. Is It's Jesus. This is now the second time we have Revelation. Now we have this. There's many, many more that establish we're judged based on our works. Now let's flip over to James chapter 2. This is James, not the disciple of Jesus uh, that was one of the 12. This is James, Jesus' half-brother, uh, that after the resurrection... James is one of the individuals that Jesus goes and sees in his resurrected state. We learn that from Acts. This is where James then really gets it and believes, oh my gosh, Jesus is the Messiah. And James becomes a huge prominent leader, the leader of the church, the very early church in Jerusalem. And we get that in Acts chapter 2 and moving forward from there. Uh, that's James. And he writes a letter, uh, and that's the letter of James. Um, so flip over to James chapter 2, uh, and we're going to pick it up on verse 14. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, 
if it is not accom accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures were fulfilled that says Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. James is citing Abraham as an example. Continuing on in Genesis after 17, Isaac is an older guy now. He's probably in his 30s actually at this point. Um, and God calls him to sacrifice. God calls Abraham to sacrifice his son. His son, whom he's been waiting for for so long, who was a miracle to be born through Sarah at the age that she was. God calls him to sacrifice his son. And he goes to do it. He takes Isaac up onto the mountain. And Isaac specifically says to him, Father, who is going to, uh, uh, Father, we don't have a sacrificial lamb. And Abraham says, God will provide the lamb. And Abraham literally takes the knife and is about to kill his son. And God stops him and says, you have faith. Thank you. You've shown me that you have faith. Don't kill Isaac. And then they find a goat uh, uh, um, caught in a bush and use that as the sacrifice. God provided the sacrifice. But James is using that as an example. Abraham is an example of works. Faith without works is dead, is what James is saying. These, these verses that I've quoted clearly establish that the Bible makes an argument that we are judged by our works. Okay, so that's one side of the argument, and it's a pretty strong one. Now let's go and look at the other side of it. Uh, Ephesians 2, I'm going to read off all these. You don't need to uh, flip to them um, unless you want to, and you're very fast uh, at doing that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Galatians 2.16, a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Further on in Galatians 2.21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for it is righteousness could be gained through the law. Christ died for nothing. If we are able to achieve righteousness and salvation by the things we do, why did Christ die? Galatians 3.2-3, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Titus 3.5 He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to actually see Paul in Romans. While we were yet sinners, Christ died to save us. And that's a, a verse coming up in Romans that we're going to hit on. So, uh, is this a contradiction? Now let's look outside the Bible at, at church historians, church fathers, big men of faith. Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation. He reads Romans 1.16, and I mentioned this before, but Romans 1.16 says this, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And I talked about that when we hit on the very beginning of Romans, Romans 1, 16 through 18. And from that, Martin Luther writes his 99 theses and uh, nails them to the church in Wittenberg. And the reason, what hit him so strongly is it's not through our works. The Catholic church at the time was all about works and that your salvation was through the things that you did, through your acts, indulgences. You would actually uh, lessen your time in purgatory uh, by the amount of money that you gave uh, through the indulgences. I mean, this that's not a biblical teaching. And Luther looked at it and said, wait, it's not through our works. It is by faith alone. But Martin Luther also said, if good works do not follow... It is certain that this faith in Christ does not dwell in our heart. So Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, we are saved by faith alone, also said, if good works do not follow, it is certain that this faith in Christ does not dwell in our heart. So which is it? The Bible teaches that people are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and yet will be judged according to their works. Is this a contradiction in the Bible? Is this an intolerable impasse? No, it is not. This is not a contradiction in the Bible. It's both. So what does that mean? Well, let's get back to the very beginning of salvation. Salvation is getting into heaven to be saved, to, to have righteousness, to be right with God. You achieve that simply by faith. It's through grace, unmerited, unearned grace, favor from God. What did we do to deserve it? Nothing whatsoever. How do we get it? All we have to do is believe Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your heart and say with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That is clear. So now, what about all this stuff about works? I mean, specifically, uh, Romans 2, 5 through 7, Revelation 22, 12, Matthew 25, uh, 31 through 42, James 2, 14 through 26, all of those are clear. These are Jesus' words in the last two of those, are in Revelation and in Matthew. Those are talking about works. It's clear in the Bible that we as believers are going to be judged based on our works. You're still saved. You're getting into heaven. But the Bible talks about rewards in heaven that by our good deeds we'll achieve rewards. It talks about uh, rewards in heaven. It also talks about uh, treasure in heaven. And the Bible also talks about crowns. There's actually four different types of crowns that the Bible talks about. That These are all things that, that we really don't quite fully understand, but that are referenced in the Bible. If you want, for you note takers, if you want to do a study on crowns, here are five passages to look up. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.8, 2 Timothy 4.8, James chapter 1, verse 12, James 1.12, 1 Peter 5.4, 1 Peter 5.4, and Revelation 2.10, as well as, as Revelation 3.1. So Revelation 2.10 and Revelation 3.1. Those are all specifically talking about crowns that we receive in heaven. Rewards that we receive in heaven. Now, treasures in heaven. Jesus specifically talked about that. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Romans 14, 
Uh, Verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will stand before God's judgment seat as it is written. As surely as you live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Romans 14 We're going to hit on in, good grief, probably 10 weeks, because we're in Romans 4 now. But Romans 14, as well as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, those are both Paul, and he's clearly talking to Christians. Okay, So the judgment seat of Christ, what is that? Jesus talks about the fact that we're supposed to store up treasures in heaven. What is that? How do we do that? The judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. What are those? These are the two judgments that await everybody, all mankind. Uh, In fact, let's go and look at this. Uh, Revelation 20. So flip over to Revelation 20, and we're going to look at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verse 11. So this is uh, John who is given this revelation from Christ. And this is what John writes. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them to hide. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment, as we just read in Revelation <clears throat> judgment. There were books that were opened, and there was another book, the book of life, and there's other books. Those other books account for the deeds we do here on earth. The book of life is a name, a listing of names of those people who are saved, who don't receive the judgment of the great white throne judgment. So everyone is judged based on their deeds. If your name is written in the book of life, your judgment is different. That's what's called the Bema Seat judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. If your name is not in the book of life, then you have to go through the great white throne judgment. And that is looking at at your whole history, all your good deeds, all your bad deeds. They will be weighed and... No one is perfect. So therefore, no matter how many good deeds you do, it will never be enough to swing that balance to justify you, to have you be righteous, which is why we need Christ. That's the whole point of it. So now let's talk about the Bema Seat judgment. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 is the judgment seat of Christ. We just read that. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I don't know exactly what it means. I am just excited to get into heaven. But the Bible tells us that we will be rewarded with treasures in heaven. I think getting into heaven is a good enough reward. But our good deeds will be judged on whether they were selfish or selfless when we get to heaven. And we will be rewarded. You will get into heaven through your faith, through grace in Christ. But once in heaven, those rewards that you receive will be determined based on the good deeds that you did. So it is both. That's the whole point of this, of the question of is it faith or is it works? It's not just faith. And it's not just works, it's faith that works. 
by our works, our faith will be judged. And the argument is a logical one that James makes. It's that if you say that you have faith in Christ, but yet there are no, uh, there's no fruit from that, there's no good deeds that happen, nothing that comes from that, James is arguing you never had faith to begin with, that it was an empty statement of faith, that you didn't actually believe because there's no fruit. And Jesus specifically says this, by their fruit will you know them to be my children. That's where that comes in, is it's faith that works. If you have faith in Christ, good deeds will follow. Let me read a few, uh, no, uh, where did they go? I have a few quotes to read. Stephen Treas argued that at the final judgment, works provide evidence as to whether the basic direction of one's life has been toward God or away from him. And then John Piper was quoted as saying, our deeds will be the public evidence brought forth in Christ's courtroom to demonstrate that our faith is real. Our deeds are not the basis of salvation. They are the evidence of our salvation. They're not foundation. They are demonstration. Both of those two quotes I got from uh, this book series, which um, I have the whole CounterPoint series, which is great. It's a ton of books. But the, they're, it's called CounterPoints. It's, it's produced by Zondervan. And it's a whole series of books that are on individual topics. And this one is The Role of Works at the Final Judgment. Uh, and it puts up four different views on works and what those are. And that's where I got those two quotes. Um, it's a very interesting read, and I will put a link to it uh, in the notes on YouTube so that you can see that. Uh, I also will say, I'll put the link to the Bible Dictionary. Um, I do use this. It's an older publication uh, from Zondervan, but uh, still is phenomenal. The Bible's kind of old, and so the definitions from the 90s are still through, true today. Um, but a good reference. I suggest every Christian have a good, solid Bible dictionary, uh, and I'll put the link to that uh, in our notes as well. So that wraps up um, our talk today and Romans chapter 4 in looking at this example that Paul gives in Abraham in salvation uh, and righteousness through faith, not through works. But I hope that, that you can walk away from this and understand that it's not just faith alone. Yes, faith on its own gives us our salvation and our ticket into heaven. But if you truly believe, you will seek after God and you will want to follow him and pursue him. And the fact that you're doing this Bible study right now is evidence of that, is that you want to grow closer to God. You want to understand his Bible better. And the more you focus on God, the more you drop to your knees, as we saw Abraham do in God's presence, and invite God into your life and ask him to change you from the inside out, what will follow our works. The problem that we get into as Christians, so we go to church on Sunday, especially uh, Christers. <laughs> what are Christers? Christians that go to church on Christmas and Easter. They check off that box if it's ever asked, uh, what is your faith? And you, they put down Christian, right? But they only go to church on Christmas and Easter. And they don't actually l let things permeate through them. That is the side. The, the, that's the ones where James is questioning, do your works come from it? The Christer might look and say, okay, in order to be a Christian, I need to have these works. I need to do these things. So they go all about doing these things. Okay, I need to tithe. Okay, I am going to tithe. I need to feed the, the hungry. Okay, so I'm going to go to a soup kitchen and I'm going to do this. And what they do is aim after the works. But the problem is, where is your heart at? If you are trying to prove that you are a good Christian by your works, your motivation is wrong. All God wants is your heart. And if you are seeking him first, good works will follow because God will change your heart. But if you try to prove your faith 
and your belief in God by doing all these things, if your heart is not in the right place first, the works are pointless and they're dead and the reward you're gonna receive by the accolades that you receive, oh my gosh, that's so cool that you did that. You know, doing a little Facebook post, like, ooh, at the, at the uh, soup kitchen today, feeding the homeless, I'm a good person, yay, click. The reward that you get from those accolades on Facebook is the extent of that reward. Jesus talks about this uh, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, right after the Sermon on the, on the Mount. He talks about the fact that your giving should be done in private. Your prayer should be done in private. So the reward that you receive is in heaven. I'm, I'm finished with that tangent. The last thing, the last verse that I want to quote is one of my favorites. It's right here. It's 1 Corinthians 9.24. Paul says, do you not know that in a race, everybody runs, but only one person wins the prize? So therefore, run to win the prize. In the games, all the athletes go into strict training, but they train for a crown that will not last. We train for a crown that will last for eternity. And therefore, I do not run around aimlessly and beat the air like a boxer, in training, no, I beat my body and put it into submission so that after I have run the race, I too will be in the running for the prize. The idea of that is that one, we're supposed to go into to strict training and we're supposed to be regimented and pursue Christ and pursue our faith as if training for the Olympics is that analogy. But the same thing we've been talking about is, is that pursuing that for human gain is the same idea as going after winning a, a gold medal simply to have the gold medal. That will fade. There will be somebody else who gets that gold medal. But if you do it for eternity and your goal is righteousness in Christ, that crown will endure forever. I hope this has been a, a helpful lesson, a helpful talk, uh, and this argument of faith or works um, that you understand it a little bit beggar, better. Dig into the scriptures that I've quoted and do the study for yourself. Today is, what, November 30th? Right, Jake? Is it November 30th? It is November 30th. Um, I am going to be taking a break. Jake doesn't know this. I'm taking a break uh, from doing these teachings for the month of December. Why am I doing that? There is a lot going on in December for both me, for my business, but also for you in your life. December, the holidays, family, all of this gets very, 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 very busy. And the thing that's also awesome, your local church does the Advent season. The teachings are phenomenal. So dig into those studies in the month of December and look at, at Advent season and Jesus, the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus the Messiah and his coming to earth and do studies of your own on that. We'll be picking it back up in January right here and we'll be on Genesis chapter, Genesis, whoa. It'll be years if we're continuing through in this progress. It'll be years before we hit Genesis. No, we'll do Romans chapter 5. So if you are following along with these week by week when they air, have a phenomenal Advent season. Merry Christmas. And if you are picking up on these uh, later on, it's just going to be a blink of an eye, and we're already in 2022. Happy New Year. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Have a phenomenal Christmas, and I'll see you next year.